like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lulin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and being with us. It will be, a, I would say, a great hour with uh, fascinating research about how technology can help us in gain our health span and maybe also lifespan. And Dr. Panos Stafilas is with us. Um, please uh, send your questions. There might be many uh, using the Q&A function. And also, of course, your other comments are highly recommended and uh, welcome. First, we start, as always, with a short presentation, um, this time by Zui Ho our student from the Center for Health and Longevity uh, at the School of Medicine. And she will talk about clinical biomarkers associated with health span and with lifespan. Zoe, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. This is Zoe here. I'm an intern from the Center for Healthy Longevity. And today I will be sharing a study about the association of biomarkers with health and lifespan. So the study paper is called Clinical Biomarkers and Associations with Healthspan and Lifespan, Evidence from Observational and Genetic Data. So before I start, here are just some terms to understand. For lifespan, we are talking about the period of the time between your birth and your death, and the end of the lifespan would be about death. So for the healthspan, it is actually between when the person is having a very good health and any chronic disease will, be, will be defined as the end of the health span. And the third common terms that you encounter in this study paper would be biomarkers. And a biomarker is something that can be measured and is in a biological state or condition. So some examples can be, for example, hemoglobin, lipids, and proteins. So for some context, the study actually uh, are aiming for 10 biomarkers to focus. And of the 10, seven of them are significantly associated with health span or lifespan. So whether is it good or bad. And the study take in 12,098 Swedish data, ranging from 47 to 94 years old, and there are 16 years of follow-up. So the first thing we are looking at is this graph. As you can see the trend, as we age from young to old, the risk of encountering any disease or death increase exponentially. So after the age of 60, the rate of increase actually slows down. And generally speaking, if you look at the trend of the graph, the risk of encountering any chronic disease will be always higher than the risk of death. So first thing we are looking at for the data or the results is the association between the serum biomarkers, meaning the biomarkers that found in the blood, how it relates to the health or lifespan. So for the graph on the left, we can see that it is serum biomarkers and the risk of any chronic disease, meaning the end of health span. So there's a dotted line at the point 1.0. Any data or result that's above one, and is significant enough, we will indicate this as a higher risk of encountering chronic disease. And anything that is lower than one, it will be a lower risk. So as you can see from the data, the first four biomarkers 
will show a higher risk and the last three will have a lower risk of encountering any chronic disease. So the one at the middle, the three yellow highlighted one, even though there is a less than or more than one slightly, it is not significant enough. So we don't count that. So for the graph on the right, it is the association between the biomarkers and the risk of death. So both graphs shows a similar trend, meaning higher risk or lower risk, except for the ones at the middle, HB, APOB, and LDLC. So unlike the graph on the left, which shows like a, just a normal, no higher or lower risk, the risk of death for these three biomarkers is actually lowered if the biomarkers are alleviated. So what are the implications? Alleviated glycemic biomarkers, it will show a stronger detrimental effects, meaning it will cause a higher risk of either death or chronic disease. For HDR-related biomarkers, if you have a lot more in your body, it will show the strongest protective effects, meaning you have a lower risk of any chronic disease and death. So next one, I'll move on to genetic variation and how it's actually associated with health span and lifespan. So as you can see, the only two significant results would be FPG and CRP from the left and right. So for FPG, it's called fasting blood glucose. And elevated level of this fasting blood glucose as shown by the gene itself will cause a higher risk of any chronic disease. And for the CRP, C-reactive protein, it will show a lower risk. So for the rest of them, there are weak association with the health span and lifespan because the results are not significant enough. So after which, the study team actually did additional statistical control of the data and found that if the serum fasting blood glucose is controlled, the significance of the one at the left, meaning the higher risk, the significance is lost. So it means that alleviated serum fasting blood glucose, it plays a role in the association of this between the genes and the higher risk of the chronic disease. So what are the implications here? Genetically predicted fasting blood glucose was positively associated with health span, meaning that you have a higher risk of any chronic disease. This association can be largely explained by the serum concentration itself. And therefore, we can come to a conclusion that this suggests a possibility of glucose control and lifestyle or medication intervention so that we can actually maintain a healthier lifestyle. For example, we can have dietary restriction, exercising, or even drugs to control the glucose, to lower down the glucose so that we can live healthily. So that's all for my presentation. I come to the end. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, So, And uh, good to hear that the markers we measure in clinical practice, like glucose and HB1AC, uh, are actually so associated with outcomes like uh, disease and mortality. And by the way, uh, you should know that Zoe just has been admitted to medical school. So congratulations. Very good. Um, that brings me to the stage that I can introduce our speaker today, and that's Dr. Panos Stafilas, and he is a clinical cardiologist with lots of experience, more than 20 years experience in digital health, and including, and I had to look it up what it really is, HTA, that's Health Technology Assessment. And in 2014, he co-founded HealthThink, uh, to offer really what we, I think, need in clinical practice, and that is health technology assessment, health economics, bioethics, uh, and research, and of course, development services for pharmaceutical companies. But also he works with SME, small, medium enterprises, and of course has academic and research organizations he is uh, contributing uh, uh, to. He has uh, successfully uh, coordinated lots of projects with pharma industry and device companies, more than 30, and uh, has lots of um, involvement in innovative uh, products, uh, around about 80. And Dr. Cephalas is, uh, next to his um, commercial involvement, also affiliated with lots of Greek uh, universities, actually three, and that's the Medical School of um, Thessaloniki, and the Medical School of Athens and the Department of Business Administration of the University of um, Macedonia. 
And he is really very involved in teaching uh, what we should know in terms of the health technology assessment, health economics and modeling, et cetera. And I think um, I would like to be your student to actually hear from you in these kind of uh, uh, university uh, seminars. So I think we really are honored to have you here. I know you from um, consortia we do in, in Europe, and we are really looking to forward to hearing from you how what really health technology assessment uh, is and how we could improve health span. So the floor is your Panos. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Professor, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with uh, you and to discuss about this very interesting uh, topic uh, for me. Um, I would like to, to explain how we can use health technology assessment as a, as a tool uh, in order to uh, promote uh, technologies that uh, support uh, healthy longevity. So what I will try to, to explain to you is uh, we will uh, see how we can use this exotic term of health technology assessment, which is actually very relevant with what all of us are doing, even if we talk about research, about academic, about uh, um, um, uh, SMEs or medical devices or pharma uh, industry. And what I will try to explain is what is health technology assessment? How is it applied? If there are established frameworks, methods, as uh, uh, we say, and how uh, can health technology assessment support innovative solutions to increase healthy longevity. And I will finish it with the experience from some of the projects I have the honor to coordinate and uh, evaluate. Um, obviously, my, my main experience comes from, uh, uh, from uh, the Europe. However, uh, what I will present to you has also uh, tested and uh, used in the United States of America and in, uh, in Australia. So let's start with the definition. What is health technology assessment? Health technology assessment is a multidisciplinary process that uses explicit methods to determine the value of a health technology at different points in its life cycle. So we talk about a way, a scientific way to assess the value and being able to compare with other technologies. And why we need this? We need this in order to inform decision making, in order to promote an equitable, efficient, and high quality health system in order to select which are the more efficient technologies to extend uh, the healthy uh, longevity. Which are the main questions if we want to make it simpler and uh, our uh, English friends and nice make it simpler? There are two main questions that we can directly uh, reply. How well does the technology work compared to established practice in our usual clinical or uh, care, in the clinical setting, in the NHS or um, in other fields? And the next question, if this new technology works well, is how much this, this uh, cost compared to the established practice? And these are the main questions that every time that we need to buy or to fund or to reimburse a service, um, uh, we try to reply. Since the health systems across the world face significant challenges about how they will fund and how they support uh, the aging population, there are several initiatives across the world about how we will make it and how we will have common methods to do this. Uh, without any doubt, the most important initiative is the European Network for Health Technology Assessment, in which all the European countries participate, but also countries from other uh, uh, regions. And in this, there is an established framework each time that we want to assess a health technology, a health technology even if we talk about medicines, medical devices, methods, um, maybe a campaigns for uh, uh, smoking cessation or whatever, we have to assess nine different domains. And these are to describe the health problem and the current use of technology, to describe the technical characteristics of the technology we suggest, the safety, the clinical effectiveness, obviously. And it is true that uh, 
our medical background make us more uh, familiar with the safety and clinical effectiveness issues and we forget the others. But also we have to see about the cost and the economic effectiveness and other aspects like ethical organization, patient and social aspects and legal aspects. And the main question is if we can apply this framework in all type of health technologies. And obviously, the easy reply is no, we cannot. And this is because the typical product life cycle of different health technologies is totally different. Think about the time of the development of a new medicine and for how many years we use a medicine and the time that we need in order to develop a new app and how often we have new versions of this app. This makes this framework, among other also differences, very difficult to apply when we talk about digital health tools. And so the European Commission identified these issues and identified also that we have a very late introduction of new technologies and digital health tools in the healthcare systems. And that's why the expert panel that uh, uh, made this report suggested specific frameworks in order to assess the impact of digital transformation of health services. And in this report, the European Commission clearly suggests three different frameworks to inform centralized decision making and to fund and reimburse this. And this three frameworks is MAST, the model of assessment of telemedicine, is JSEN, is the proposal of a joint action of e-health network, and the proposal of World Health Organization a few years ago. I had the honor to be involved in the development of MAST and JSEN, so I will present in a few more details these two frameworks. The first, the MAST, the model for assessment of telemedicine was originally uh, started to be developed in 2009 with a funding from the European Commission and the consortium led by the Norwegian Center for Integrated Care and Telemedicine. So this project was uh, called Method Element. It actually developed a structured framework for the assessment of telemedicine services to support decision making. The next year, a new project started, and actually this was my first project as scientific coordinator, very new in health, which was led by the Odense University Hospital, which previously also uh, participated in the Method Element project. And in this case, the MAST was developed, tested, and validated. And in this project, we suggested that seven domains should be uh, uh, used in order to assess any type of telemedicine or digital health. And these were the health problem and characteristics, safety, clinical effectiveness, patient perspectives, economic aspects, organizational aspects, and also uh, ethical and uh, legal issues. Today, the MAST uh, uh, model is the most a broadly used model in uh, European projects. We have more than eight EU-funded projects and there are tens of other projects in uh, uh, Europe, in uh, America and in Australia that have already used um, uh, this model. But then there was another need. We talk about this digital transformation of healthcare uh, systems. So the joint action to support the health network asked for a framework to assess, to assess national projects. And we had the honor to lead this uh, project too. And in this case, we suggested a framework to be able to respond to these requirements. And this workflow, how we do it in practice, included the setting of a general scope of the HTA, the assessment of specific domains and issues, collection and analyzing the data, and of course, uh, reporting. And if we want 
to see in a few more details, we follow the PICO structure. So we've described the population, the intervention, the comparator, and the outcomes. We include a checklist for potential ethical, organizational, patient, social, and legal aspects if relevant. We assess the maturity of technology, and of course, we have a project plan. And the maturity of technology is very important because we know that the initial development of a technology we see different uh, results than when we reach the steady state, or as we say, the maturity state of a technology. And this is a different way to assess this. Think about the research that you perform in your universities or in, a, in a, a publicly funded uh, research projects. And there are different needs during the initial project to develop a technology, and there are different needs after the end of the project. So at the beginning, we have to assess if the project or the technology working as intended. And this is called actually monitoring. And at the end, when we reach the maturity state, then we have to assess if this technology yields the desired effect. So what we really assess is more or less the different models, either the European models or the American models, in most cases assess the same domains with different weighting depending on, uh, uh, on these needs. So we describe the health and social situation, but what is more important is that we do not talk only about patients or about diseases. So it's very important, the care effectiveness, and also the care recipient, the care givers, the clients or the citizens' perspectives. And of course, the economic aspects as well, organizational, sociocultural, ethical, and legal aspects. And the other important issue is that the different stakeholders weight in a different way the different elements of an evaluation. For example, for the citizens, and especially for the seniors, is more important to be able to self-manage their disease or their status. They need to feel security and they feel they need to, to feel independent and to have an improvement quality of life. And this is value for a technology that they will use. From the other hand, for their uh, uh, children, for their informal caregivers, the opportunity to participate in the management of, of their parents, for example, or um, the peace of mind over a very reduced care burden are very important elements of uh, uh, any technology. And of course, there are the perspective of the professional caregivers. Even if we talk for the service providers or for the developers of the technology or for the healthcare providers. And in this case, what is important is the identification of uh, uh, the services uh, needed the coordination, the improved caregiver efficiency, and even more importantly, the reduced workload and the improved customer satisfaction. And if we talk about from the clinical point of view, we talk about early detection of deterioration, early and preventive interventions, monitoring of uh, effect effectiveness and uh, safety, and of course, revenues and quality of life. And of course, if we talk about the payers, certainly the first priority now is the reduced care cost, the improved customer satisfaction and the enhanced quality of life. So is it feasible to assess all of this? I will, I will try to explain with some examples from, uh, from uh, uh, European projects, the results in some of these element and this is, is uh, uh, the hands-on experience that we have with um, our uh, um, uh, colleagues. And I will start with the uh, free European uh, Union-funded integrated care projects, but with the aim to identify the changes introduced by implementing ICT-supported integrated health and social care in different domains according to the mass evaluation framework. We have tested these services and we made evaluation in 22 European regions from Greece and Portugal and Spain, in, uh, Finland, Estonia, and uh, Scotland. And we have included in the evaluation group more than 3,000 patients with a mean age 
of more than 77 years old. Especially in the beyond silos, the mean age of the population was more than 80 years old. And of course, these patients have comorbidities and the median comorbidities were uh, three. So we, we talk about, let's say, uh, the usual uh, population in these um, age groups. And what we have seen, we have seen that if we clearly select the appropriate population and the appropriate digital health tools that we want to, to apply, then we may have benefits. Mainly, we can reduce days hospitalized and we can keep this population in the primary care setting, so uh, at home. Another important element is the patient perspective. It's very important that patients feel that they had an enhanced care, that they have a um, um, uh, safety, improved uh, feeling of safety, satisfaction. And in any case, they didn't feel that this integrated care can replace uh, their uh, routine care. So they, do, they don't want to replace their usual care, but they need all these tools and integrated care and innovation as add-on to their regular uh, care. Another important element is how we perform the economic evaluation. And in order to do this, we use exactly what is suggested by Dramont and by the International Society of Pharmacoeconomics and Outcomes Research. So we have two different diversions, but we compare. First, we assess the health outcomes as we do in clinical trials. Then we assess the resources uses and make the costing. And at the end, we estimate the cost effectiveness. What is not clearly understood is that cost effective does not mean cost saving. Cost effective means that we have a service that we can pay more, but if we pay more, this what we will take is one more than the accepted. And usually in each country, there are some thresholds. And so, for example, in a United Kingdom, there is a, a threshold of 20,000 pounds per quality adjusted years. In other countries, it's 20 to 30,000 uh, euros uh, for a service to be acknowledged as cost effective. And I will give you an example for a project in the Basque country. And we provide it in patients with heart failure and uh, comorbidities receiving multiple um, medicines, integrated. Uh, health and social care. And we said with our models that although the population, the elite population is predicted that will increase more than 20%, if we assign these uh, methods, if we apply these methods in this setting, then the cost will be reduced, but we will be able to reduce days uh, in hospital and we can delay uh, deaths. So this means that we will keep the patients at home. And the cost effectiveness analysis in this case, so that we can achieve this with an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of about 4,000 euros per quality adjusted life year with a threshold for uh, the Basque country of 30,000 euros. Seeing these results, the Basque government designed to uh, reimburse the service. So this service is now standard care for the patients fulfilling these characteristics. In another setting, and this is an example for Italy from the region of Friuli Venezia Giulia in uh, uh, Northern Italy, in a, in a different population with advanced heart failure, we see that if we uh, introduce uh, integrated health and social care, in these cases, we apply two different methods. We have two independent teams, one based from Osaki Data, led by Javier Ma. It is a public organization for health technology assessment in the Basque Country. And the other led by myself from uh, Greece. And we evaluated the smart care results in Friuli Venezia Giulia. And in this case, we saw that, yes, in this case, we have savings and we have better results. So this service is dominant. And this is mainly because we see that we reduce the days in hospital, 
we were more conservative in our estimations. Our Basque friends were more enthusiastic, so they have they demonstrated better results. But in any case, both different models and different uh, uh, methods uh, showed that we can uh, reduce hospital days and that we can uh, reduce the economic burden of the healthcare system. But who will pay to develop innovative solutions to increase healthy longevity? And I think that most of us are involved in different initiatives. So certainly we use research funds. We use public uh, funding from the payer, from the social security system. There are also private health insurance coverage, industry partners, healthcare providers. And in some cases, even the employers or the patients uh, pay for this. But what they need, they need evidence. They need to be convinced to pay for this. And in order to take this evidence, then they need the health technology assessment. So what evidence do we need? Except of what we have already described, included in the health technology assessment in the MAST and the JSON domains, we need also to see if the solution we suggest is sustainable, if it can be transferred to other settings, if we can, it is scalable, so we can uh, increase the population receiving this, if we can generalize in other disease areas, and of course, if we talk about private investments, if it is uh, profitable. And which is the methods that we use in order to support this and to support the development of these tools? It's what we call informed free decision making, and it includes three main steps. The first is to identify all available data, administrative, electronic health records, registries, studies, and to use in an appropriate way. Then to use all other data coming from different digital health tools and the digital health eco ecosystem is growing uh, continuously. Then design and assess all these domains that we said, safety, effectiveness, economic outcomes, organizational outcomes, but then we need a first step. And this first step is to simulate, to develop predictive models in order to predict what will happen based on this data in order to assess the sustainability, scalability, and transferability of this service. And this is something that is very critical in the development of new tools. So this is the process if we want to approach and to move faster. And this is the way, for example, to use opportunities like what has already suggested by our German friends, because there, the physicians have already the option to prescribe digital health tools in order to support disease management or to support the healthy uh, longevity. So in conclusions, dear uh, colleagues, uh, please keep these uh, main messages. Health technology assessment is a tool and it is a multidisciplinary process that uses explicit methods to determine the value of a health technology at different points in its life cycle and the impact on society and stakeholders involved. The second is that European Commission public authorities, but also uh, Medicare and Medicaid, Australia system, I'm not uh, 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 really familiar with the ASEAN uh, initiatives in this field, recommend specific health technology assessment frameworks already tested and validated and MAST and JSON framework are the most famous uh, and the most broadly uh, used. We have to use the appropriate HTA framework and techniques to support decision-making for a sustainable, equitable, and efficient health system which increase health longevity. We have to support the optimization of healthcare services and projects and modeling and simulation in this case are uh, extremely important. And this is the way to ensure that the new technology will get fast and sustained access into the market at the right price and for the right patients. What we call in the industry market access for this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Penos. Thank you very much for this great um, 
presentation. Um, may I start with asking you to give maybe an example of what digital health technology or health technology is? Okay, let's give you an example. For example, we have uh, some people that we want to, to promote uh, a healthy lifestyle. Okay, what we can have, for example, even having a wearable or a digital platform, we can assess some daily habits. For example, I wear a smartphone and when I'm sitting too many hours making presentations or reading or writing, there is a, a, a signal, please uh, move or have some exercise. Or when I have some physical exercise, there is a, a congratulation message in order to promote a more healthy lifestyle. So this is something that in the long term, we, we feel that uh, um, will really support um, uh, healthy longevity. For example, now my, my patients, okay, I'm a cardiologist, so most of my patients are uh, more than 60 years old, but usually they, they monitor their daily habits and their exercise, and when they are coming in my practice, okay, they also report which was their exercise, which were their heart rate during exercise, and if they feel. So this is a small example of this, and you are uh, you know very well, but now that we can use AI algorithms and machine learning in order not only to, uh, to assess the risk in the daily habits, but in order to guide the different citizens with a more personalized uh, uh, advice about how uh, to have a healthy lifestyle. Yes, I, I think that's a great example. I think as we as clinicians really uh, want that kind of information from, from our patients, we don't want to hear, yes, I walked, but we want to see, yes, we walked, how many steps and quantify that. I think that's really how we should transform healthcare. But that brings me to the next question, because I, look, I try to, to embrace uh, e-health and integrate it into the hospital where I worked, but all the time I was confronted with a quite conservative system. Whereas if we look at other businesses, um, like it's very normal that we have digital tools for uh, managing our money in banks accounts, for example. We, if we want a flight ticket, we just go an internet site and we don't go anymore to a, a location where we actually being handed out a flight ticket. So how it, why is the medical system so conservative and so lacking behind compared to other businesses where we are confronted with every time in our life, every day, every minute? Every now, because are, we are zooming. <laughs> you are absolutely, you are absolutely right, and I, I will say that, you know, several years ago, I, 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 I was thinking if I want to be a cardiologist or an economist, and when I completed, I graduated from the medical school in in Greece. I said, now I want also to to be trained in uh, in economics. And my professor, I'm a, I'm a cardiologist and my, uh, I'm a, I'm a specially trained in hypertension. My professors then, about 20 years ago, said, but no, economics is not for physicians. But this made us, because we were not familiar with this, not to participate in these discussions. So when we have a manager in a hospital setting, the rules for funding, the rules for buying, uh, new services or new technologies are very well uh, described, especially if it is from the public sector. So what we need is to, to talk in their language in order to convince them. So we need evidence. And the book evidence is not the results of a randomized clinical trial. It's how easy it will be to introduce this technology in clinical care. You know very well that several times we have amazing results for an app from a device, but we can never use it because we have to use 20 different apps, not possible. 30 different tools, not possible. So we have to find a way to introduce this in the clinical care and also to provide the evidence about which would be the benefit for the payer, which will be the benefits for the hospital if you apply this. 
if you provide the evidence to the manager of the hospital, then he will accept this. And I would have to say that there is a, a, another very interesting initiative about um, a hospital-based um, uh, HDA. And I have to say, for example, I think that one of the best results I have worked with is the Odense University Hospital. There is an innovation unit, and each time that they want to introduce an innovation in the hospital, then they have a health technology assessment, and this way they provide the evidence and decide uh, the manager based on this evidence if we will be convinced from the physicians because each of us needs has different needs or if we will invest this money in other uh, solutions. Yeah, so, so thank you to give a little bit of blueprint of how to write a business case for your manager to convince the CEO <laughs> to then give the technology to the patients into the services. Um, but um, I, I think there is, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it's, I think, because of all the growing technologies we have, and we also have now EMRs, electronic medical records, which captures all the information. And then technologies, emerging technologies kick in, and lots of apps kick in, as you already said. How do we make sure in the future, because of all the technology, that that is actually interconnected with a basis, which is called EMR? And it's, I know it for myself, it's quite difficult. So do you have a solution? And, and how, do you, how do you see that field of interacting devices and who, um, who are all not interconnected, or at least it's, it's hard? You are absolutely right. This is one of the main uh, barriers in the introduction of new technologies in, in usual care. And this is because, the, let's say, the big companies, the established uh, companies of health technology, do not allow, they are not interoperable. So what we need is interoperability. And in order to do this, the payor, for example, when you build and you have an EMR and you have an organization, should have one term in the contracts about new technologies. But we need an open interoperability protocol so that each technology can be updated or new elements can always be added. Of course, there are, uh, in some cases, conflicts. There are financial issues around this. But this is a main issue. To give you an example, OK. I'm, I'm a cardiologist, and as a cardiologist, I have different uh, uh, technologies in my uh, clinical practice. So, okay, I have an echocardiogram, an ECG, uh, halters, uh, blood pressure monitors, electronic medical record, and the national prescription system. Unfortunately, some data have to be introduced at least three times because, for example, GE or Medronic or other companies do not allow the data to be exported in an interoperable way to other settings. But this is something that it is continuously improved. And I think that there are already some protocols, both in the United States and in uh, Europe, that are uh, showing that we move towards this direction. So, yeah, I, I think that that really needs more work to make it easier also for health services to, to implement it. Um, so you're talking, I think, a little bit about the medical devices on the one hand side, the halter, etc. But then I think there is a huge market measuring our lifestyle, how our sleep is, uh, for example, and how many steps we, we take, what the glucose uh, level is 24-7, for example. What is your opinion? Because I think there is a little bit debate who owns these, um, these data. Uh, no, I think that uh, it is clear that uh, the patient or the citizen uh, owns this data. However, this data can be used also from other stakeholders. For example, a government can use citizens' data in order to provide more efficient policies. Uh, the scientific associations could use this data in order to further support research and uh, uh, promote this. The problem is that uh, although it seems that concerning the, the, there is a, a framework for uh, personal uh, data uh, protection, uh, it's not, the, the main issues are around how this data will be used in order to develop AI algorithms 
and especially unintended AI algorithms, which use this data in order to guide future management of a citizen. And I think now that the main risks are there, I don't think that we have now risks about who owns this data. I think that in most uh, countries, this has already been solved. But uh, when we talk about use of messy data, about big data, then there are uh, still some issues. And I think that uh, universities and, uh, and public authorities have to work further on this. Yeah, so thank you so much. Really highlighting that, that we own the data from our devices. And um, I think that's not very well regulated, but that's, I think that's another session <laughs> and discussion. Before handing over to Janjira So, who will have, I think, lots of questions from the audience. One more question, maybe short answer. But I, I saw in your slides that uh, older individuals like technology and they prefer to actually have that because they gain quality of life and have less hospitalization. So, uh, do you really see that in your, your approaches? We, we see that, definitely. And isn't there a little bit of ageism that we all think, oh, no, all the individuals are not tech-heavy, so don't do it? That, that's true. And, but I have to say that uh, the population, I'm a physician for 22 years now, and the, the people, my, my first patients are totally different from my current patients. Now, I do not have any single patient without... A smartphone. Some of them have also tablets and have, say, they have wearables. Okay, but even the, the, the patients or the citizens that they are not so familiar, they have some kids or wives or husbands that can support them. And we have also to think about that this generation that will go and another generation will come, but they are very familiar with all this technology. So uh, I think that uh, uh, for the generations from now, from the years of uh, 50 and uh, younger, uh, I think that all people are familiar. So it, it will not require, let's say, a very high intellectual uh, uh, level. So I don't think that this is a problem. And I have to say that 10 years ago, 12, in 2010, when we designed the Renewing Health, there were some uh, hesitations about the use of technologies from the elderly, but we saw that it was not a problem. It was never a problem, this. And uh, in, uh, I remember, I think it was either in Kiev or in Beyond Silos, we have a, a patient in the year, a, a, an old lady, I think it was 102 years old, participating and it was very familiar with this and the, at the end of the project she took as a gift a, a tablet because she was the older citizen and she was very happy but she said I have already one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's good so age should never be an argument not prescribing technology okay very good um, over to you uh, Jinjira. Hey thank you very much uh, Dr. Panos for the interesting talk so we have a number of questions from the floor. So the first question would be, um, are the HTA data available for the public to access to? Is it easy for the public to understand the data so that we can make the right choice? Uh, in some cases, yes, it is feasible, but it depends on the capacity. So there are organized units, for example, in most, uh, if not all developed countries, there are specific HTA bodies for the assessment of medicines and medical technologies. And these are either independent organizations or there are committees which assess this. Any system which has a social security system or public support of a healthcare system has such committees. But if we go to a lower level, for example, at hospitals level, or at regional health authorities level, then in several cases, this capacity uh, is missing. And in this case, there, are, uh, there could be the support of uh, universities, academic research, or private companies in order to provide this evidence to decision maker who will make the appraisal of this evidence in order to make the final decision. Okay, thank you very much. 
uh, Dr. Panos for the very interesting answer. Okay, we have another question from Emmanuel. So with regards to interoperability protocols, how safe are we from the cybersecurity perspective? Um, GDPR, is it protected and how? Yeah, uh, very, very, very nice question. Yes, uh, it, it is clear that no, we cannot say that we are absolutely safe. And I don't know if we could ever be absolutely safe. Uh, safe. There are always uh, some risks. So, for example, we have seen last years that we have uh, cyber security attacks, and for several days, some hospitals were off. We have some accidents. However, the way is not to avoid the progression. The, the way to move forward is to find solutions to make these systems uh, more uh, safe. And certainly, this is a field that, especially in the healthcare sector, but which will um, grow uh, very much. And I think that this is one of the priorities of uh, in all uh, regions uh, across the world. Thank you very much for the response. So, yeah, we have another question. So, what are some of the major obstacles and limitations of using HTAs to positively influence changes in healthcare services and policies? The main, um, yeah, the, the main problem uh, with this is uh, the lack of resources in order to make an appropriate and uh, comprehensive health technology assessment. In several cases, we have decisions that they are taken without any evidence, but only because of the proposition. So we have a technologies that says we have a health app, for example, saying that will uh, promote a healthy lifestyle. Yes, but what will be the impact of this? We assume that if we have a healthy lifestyle, we will have long-term benefits. Okay, how we support this assumption? So because in several cases, you know, we are researchers, but most of us, are not, uh, let's say, uh, uh, familiar with the term of health technology assessment and with the fact that there is clear methodology in order to assess technologies. I think that when this will be part of our, uh, uh, our, our training, okay, then this will improve the things. I'm, I have graduated from the medical school in 2000 and I have never been trained in health technology assessment and in the fact that in some cases I have to prescribe to my patients not the best medicine, but what is most cost effective. There was no cost effectiveness uh, term in my medical training. Okay, so we, we need training in order to, uh, to be, and I think that these are the main limitations, capacity, resources to do, and lack of familiarity with these methods. Thank you very much for the response once again. So we have yet another question. So how do HTAs apply to uh, direct to consumer digital health solutions? Okay, in this case, it's, it's, the situation is, uh, is uh, different. Usually the requirements for uh, such cases are, let's say, uh, less time consuming. So what we, what we need usually, because we do not have in this case big clinical trials, we have the feasibility studies and we have small trials to see the effectiveness and safety. But what is most important in this case, and uh, unfortunately the developers forget this, mainly because they are not all of them at least involved in, uh, in uh, um, uh, healthcare practice, is that it's not about technology. The problem is not technology. The problem is the human factor. So we have to convince people to use a technology. And in order to do this, we have to make this technology to convince them that the use of this technology will make their life easier, even if they are patients or if they are healthcare professionals. So we need smart ways to introduce a technology in the daily life and in the daily clinical practice. If we do not do this, I don't think that these technologies are sustainable. And the data show that three out of four medical technologies and apps 
disappear from the market in three years. Okay. Carlos, may I ask which technology should definitely be introduced into clinical practice, in your clinical practice, day-to-day -day practice, which has not yet been introduced in, um, in Greece, where you practice? I think that uh, what most of, okay, I think the most important is how, how well developed is the social care system and the primary care system. Because if we want to talk about healthy longevity, then this is not based on cardiologists or on surgeons, but it's on primary uh, health care and in health policy. So let's say that I think that what we have to introduce is, let's say, policy initiatives supporting a healthy lifestyle and indicators in the daily practice, especially in the primary health care of risk stratification, early identification of risk factors like what Zoe uh, presented uh, before, in order very early to teach, to train the, the citizens, the risks around these habits and to, to, to monitor, to being able to monitor, let's say the, the change in the, the behavior. So I would say that, for example, monitoring or finding ways to introduce the monitoring of uh, exercise, physical activity, of weight, of um, lipids, of blood pressure, of uh, smoking, and creating opportunities uh, towards this direction, uh, this will be important and this lacks from most of the systems. I would, lay, I would say that Scandinavian countries uh, have made important uh, uh, improvements in this uh, field. Uh, I think that uh, all the other countries uh, follow them. That's, that's good. Um, Jen, last question. Okay. So, yeah, so we have one question here. So, what are the challenges that are associated with the HTA for speciality and high priced drugs? <laughs> okay, this is <laughs> okay. This is a thing that actually I have worked a, a lot because, uh, let's say that uh, because of the research is needed for full health technology assessment, the the main organizations that have a, the, the the most important experience in health technology assessment is the pharmaceutical sector. So we have new medicines. Uh, we have gene therapies. We have CAR T therapies. We have what we say advanced treatments. And in this case, the main challenge is that the, the frameworks that we have, and which is, are based on UNETA mainly and on NICE from the United Kingdom, are not appropriate to define the value of these uh, technologies. The main reasons for this is that usually we do not have, the, the, these frameworks have been developed with the use of big randomized clinical trials about the management of chronic diseases like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, COPD. But in these cases, for these treatments, we have just a few patients around the world. There are rare diseases in, uh, in most cases. In several, uh, uh, in several cases, we do not have randomized clinical trials, but we have one arm, single arm uh, studies. So there are methodological um, issues around this. UNETA, NICE, and several uh, universities like London School of Economics work hard in order to, to improve the setting and mainly to, to accept that the incremental cost effectiveness thresholds that have been accepted in different countries are not appropriate as a criteria for this type of, uh, of uh, treatments. Thank you so much. Um... Panos, it's, it was really a delight to, to hear um, about HTA, um, and it was not what I really Googled, <laughs> so <laughs> very, very good. I think if, um, if I, you said a couple of times that you need capacity, gross capacity, so I think you need more people who do uh, very good research and manpower. So maybe people who now say, hey, I have to switch my career will reach out to you. Is that okay? <laughs> At least to get some advice, et cetera, to grow the field? Certainly, yes, especially for the younger scientists. 
I have to say that this is a multidisciplinary assessment. So this means that uh, one physician cannot do this work, one economist cannot do this work, one bi- biologist cannot do this work. We are a small, we are an SME. Okay, we have uh, 12 consultants and we are physicians, biologists, pharmacists, economists, data analysts, uh, legal uh, experts, uh, communication experts uh, in order to cover all these elements. So I think that this is a great, opportunity for all young scientists or even for older who want to switch. And it is extremely interesting and fascinating. Yeah, thank you. And I know you have a great network. So um, thanks again for, for joining us. You as listeners, uh, please um, look at our uh, end credits or after the end credits, because we have a little bit of news. We have a new website. Uh, I find that very exciting. We worked hard on that one. So please uh, visit us and reach out if you want information. And the link to our new website will be in the chat box. And you can also um, scan the QR code, which will uh, be given after the end credits. Um, As always, uh, please leave your uh, comments or anything else you would like to tell us in the panelist and all that in the ESA option. Choose that if you use the chat function. Um, I will host uh, next week, uh, May uh, 12th, uh, Professor Andrew Scott. Uh, he's a great speaker, so please join us. And as always, we have a final video. And today it's about an interview at the tonight's show. Do you still do the split? Take care. What is your secret? Do you have a secret? Uh, think positive. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. I exercise every morning. Exercise? How much, what, what kind of exercise do you do? Well, I have a, a machine that's kind of like a, a cardio vac, some sort of right. thing. It's crossed between a rowing machine and a bicycle. Okay. How many rows do you do? Well, 150 or 200. Every day? Every morning. I won't leave my bedroom until I've done that. Wow. And okay. then I practice balancing. Right. And then I've got a rubber band and I work my arms, you know. <laughs> Now, I want to ask you about this picture. Now, this, is, this is you. When was this picture taken? Can you still do the splits? Almost, you want to see? Well, I don't want that. You want it? No, you're not going to. Can you do it? You're not going to try that, are you? Well, uh, not quite. All right. Yeah, that's not. Yeah. yeah. I thought maybe I better not. <laughs> Take my, it. My husband says it made me stop. Yeah. About when I was uh, 90 or yeah. 91. Yeah. I just figured I'd hurt myself. <laughs> Like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it. And nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down.